This is Dr. Howard Strassler speaking to you about direct placement, cusp replacement restorations as cores, foundations for crowns, amalgam as the restorative material. First we have to look at why are we doing foundations, why are we doing cores for natural teeth. Well, the causes for the need for these multi-surface preparations, uh, cusp replacement restorations, are due to loss of tooth structure uh, or restoration due to trauma, loss of tooth structure or restoration due to poor cavity design, inadequate resistance form, inadequate retention form, or there might be recurrent caries at an interface of an existing restoration. It's so large that your consideration is once it's restored with a foundation that you'll be doing a crown. Or it may be a tooth with initial caries, just uh, the patient hasn't been seen for a long period of time. So much tooth is missing that the only choice for restoration will be a foundation and a crown will be the definitive restoration for that tooth. So we're replacing restorations. Restorations are failing the cycle of replacement for restorations. That once you start placing a, a restoration in a tooth, over the course of the lifetime of that patient, that restoration will be replaced and it is very typical through the cycle of uh, restoration replacement that they get bigger, bigger, and bigger. So typically we're replacing restorations due to fracture, due to fracture of the restoration, fracture of the tooth, sometimes recurrent caries, although there may be initial caries adjacent to an existing restoration or just marginal breakdown and the restoration needs to be replaced. Our dilemma is when restoring grossly broken down teeth, large uh, restorations that are being taken out or large carious lesions, uh, your considerations are can you get adequate isolation for the core restoration and then finally what is the final restoration? Is the final restoration going to be a crown? Is the final restoration going to be an intra-extra coronal uh, inlay or onlay? Will it be a CAD CAM restoration? Will it be a restoration that will be fabricated uh, by, the, by the laboratory? And so when we're looking at preparation design for cusp replacement uh, for a complex amalgam or even a composite restoration, the final preparation of the crown will determine what and what type and where retention will be placed in that core foundation. For this picture we see right here, we have an amalgam core. It could have been a composite core. But you can see that once the tooth's been prepared, all the tooth that was around that existing restoration is gone. What's going to hold that in? Will the adhesive alone hold it in for a composite? Will we need additional types of retention for amalgam or even for composite? When we consider what the final restoration will be, we know that we need a pulpal depth of the preparation for the core of at least 2.5 to 3 millimeters. Because when you do the occlusal reduction for the future crown, that reduction in of itself will probably be about a millimeter and a half on a functional cusp. Take a look at the occlusal reduction on this uh, porcelain fused to metal crown preparation. If I had made my original core preparation only a millimeter and a half or two millimeters in depth, by the time I did my occlusal reduction, I'd be losing half the uh, restoration that it would not have enough depth to give me a resistance form for the core to resist fracture once the crown was placed. Also, we need to know where we can place accessory retention for a core of this size. Uh, and that it won't be included as part of our crown preparation. It would be a shame that when we did our crown preparation that any retention would be removed as part of the uh, uh, preparation. Uh, preparing where a pin's placed and then we just remove the pin when we do the facial shoulder. Or accessory retention would be where we do a facial shoulder. So we need to consider what will help keep that core in when we do our final preparation? It's much, more it's much more complex than placing a matrix and just placing a core, but it really relies upon planning, picturing in 
your final preparation for the foundation for the core and what will the crown preparation look like. So when do we need accessory retention for large preparations? Well, we're doing a cusp replacement restoration on a grossly mutilated tooth, overextended preparations, teeth that are questionable due to periodontal condition or endodontic treatment. When we're doing cores, foundations for cast restorations, endodontically treated teeth where a crown restoration is in the future as your definitive restoration, but also for cusp replacement restorations, there are economic factors where the patient can't afford a crown, but they don't want to lose the tooth. So we need to do a large restoration and consider what's going to hold that in place, what's going to give us retention form. So here we're looking at where we need accessory retention for large preparations, uh, cusp replacement restorations, either as a core or as a definitive restoration. To the far left, you see a core for a crown. And what's holding that core in place? Uh, or for the middle picture, uh, we have an overextended preparation where patients fractured some uh, lingual cusps and the amalgam that was present uh, came out or a grossly mutilated teeth on the far right, where uh, we have to consider periodontal considerations besides uh, restoring it. I mean, how do you get a matrix on that tooth? So we consider accessory retention, and this would be true for amalgam or for composite. We can place pins placed into the dentin. Uh, if a tooth has been endodontically treated, we can place posts as additional retention within a root canal. We can create slots, channels, and grooves within the tooth placed within cavity walls that will help retain that restorative material, whether it be composite or amalgam. And we can use bonding, adhesion, for both amalgam and composite, although for composite, uh, it's mostly used. That amalgam retention with adhesives is not used that, uh, that much that we're more so using grooves and slots, pins and endodontically treated teeth using posts for retention. Keep in mind, pins retain amalgam. They don't re reinforce the restoration. You know, concrete is reinforced. In fact, composite resin is similar to concrete, and composites actually reinforce, strengthened by pins. Amalgam is not. And in order to place a pin, if we're using a pin for retention, we must drill a channel into the dentin of the tooth. We do this with a twist drill. Uh, we always inspect the twist drill to make sure that the twist drill is in good working order. And here we see three examples of twist drills that were found in prep dispense. The top pin uh, twist drill is five millimeters long. We, we don't want you to use that. If you're given one of those, return it or throw it away. Five millimeters is too long. In fact, it would make it much more difficult to place a pinhole in the tooth. That typically we're using in the middle two millimeter long twist drills. Uh, they'll create a channel about two millimeters deep that'll allow us to put a self-threading pin into uh, that channel. You may even be given a twist drill that the uh, drill has broken off. You look at the end of this drill on the bottom, and there's no drill there. It's broken. Throw that one away. So the types of pins that we're using are self-threading pins. Imagine that we're building a deck in wood, and we want to put it together. Now, instead of using nails... We're going to pre-drill a channel into the wood that's going to be in the deck into the, uh, into the foundation that we've created, the framework for the deck. And then we're going to put a, a, a screw in there. Uh, the reason one would use a screw instead of a nail is that we can repair screwed uh, in pieces of the deck more easily. We're using an undersized channel with an oversized pin. These pins can be inserted with a hand wrench, or we can use a handpiece. That some of the pins that we use have a shoulder stop so they won't go too far in, and some have heads to give them additional retention around the restorative material. 
Now, it's always safer to use a dental dam when using a wrench to insert pins. A piece of floss should be tied to a knurled knob on a wrench, and here we're looking at a hand-placed wrench. It's why I use a hand place to, put, to place pins, and I use pins with mandrels. The, you want to put floss on it the same way you'd put floss on a dental clamp. Uh, accidents occur. In fact, what you're looking at here is a radiograph of a pin wrench in the colon for a patient. It can be a life-threatening emergency if it's aspirated. But most of our drills that, and pins we use in the clinic are used and placed with a handpiece. There's a plastic sleeve that holds the pin, as you see here with the handpiece. And the channel has already been prepared into the dentin. It's smaller than the diameter of the pin. The pin threads catch into the dentin, and you thread it in. And in most cases, the pin will separate from the mandrel. There are different types of pins with different types of retentive designs. Uh, the pins that we use in the clinic are shelf self-shearing type pins. Some of the pin systems in the clinic actually have two pins on them. So if you're placing two, it's less expensive to use a, a double pin, uh, two pins in one. So pins are made to be retentive. Uh, the restorative material will be placed around it. In fact, here we're looking at headed pins that are a titanium alloy that have been placed in the molar. And we can either place an amalgam or a composite. That the metals that are used for pins are typically stainless steel, uh, where they're either plain stainless steel or they're gold-plated. Or we have titanium alloy pins and pure titanium. So to the right, we see some gold-plated stainless steel pins. And in the tooth preparation, we see some titanium alloy pins. So when, we, when we're looking for accessory retention for overextended preparations and vital teeth, we're thinking pins, slots, grooves, channels, also called amal pins, peripheral steps, a, a cusp onlay would be a peripheral step, or adhesive, a bonding agent that's made for amalgam. Uh, or we can use an adhesive uh, that's used for composite. For non-vital teeth, we're doing the same pin slots and grooves and channels and peripheral step. We can also use an adhesive, but we also have the ability for non-vital teeth to place posts or place the restorative material into the root canal and the pulp chamber for additional retention. So here we're looking at ways that we can retain restorative materials in endodontically treated tooth. In the upper right hand photo we can see a tooth with a post and actually two pins and an amalgam restoration was placed. In the lower uh, radiograph, we can see that the amalgam was actually placed into the root canals themselves and the pulp chamber. If you're using uh, pins that you really need to understand and remember the pulpal anatomy of the tooth. If it's a vital tooth, you don't want to perforate into the pulp chamber, into the pulp itself. So understand the pulpal anatomy and the root anatomy so that you don't place the drill or the pin uh, into the pulp or into the PDL. The tooth morphology that we need to understand that when we're placing pin channels, we need to avoid perforating into furcations or root concavities. So understanding the dental anatomy of the tooth at the CEJ and below where the roots are. The pins are always placed surrounded by dentin in the D, uh, away from the DEJ. And for and vital teeth versus non-vital teeth, vital teeth uh, are a greater risk because you have a vital uh, pulp. Uh, non-vital teeth, we can use the pulp chamber and the root canals for additional retention. So understand the Tooth morphology. Pin channels should be placed to avoid perforating the tooth into furcations or root concavities. Primary sites for pin placement should be at the line angles. 
and secondary sites for pin placement are dependent upon the root concavities and root furcations. So you need to understand the dental anatomy for the tooth that you're placing pins for. Here's an example of retention sites. Now, the solid circle are primary sites, and you can see these are at the line angles. Secondary sites are uh, the uh, circles uh, that aren't solid. And you can notice that when you take a look at the molars and the premolars, that any place you see a star, that these are areas of concavities, and you want to avoid these. These are unacceptable sites for placement. Study these images. They correlate with what you know about the dental anatomy of these teeth. So now we're going to place a pin. We've decided we're going to use a pin for extra retention because we know when we do our crown preparation there won't be much tooth structure remaining. I'm going to use a self-threading pin. I'm going to use a pin twist drill. I'm going to run that dr pin drill parallel to the root surface but within to the dentin. I'm going to be parallel to the root canal. So I'm splitting the difference between the root surface and the root canal to avoid perforation into the canal and pulp chamber and avoid perforation into the PDL. I create a pilot site with a quarter round burr, just making a little dimple. The pin must be surrounded by at least half a millimeter of dentin. And we're using the electric handpiece at a very low speed. I would turn the handpiece down to 1. So we're using it at 1, not at 4. When we place the drill, we go in once. In and out, we're done. Our self-limiting drill will give us a depth of our channel of 2 millimeters. So here you can see I'm taking the drill. I'm using it similar to a periodontal probe on the left-hand side. I'm paralleling the external of the tooth, keeping in mind the pulp chamber. I then place my drill, two millimeters in depth. Following this rule, you'll avoid perforation into the PDL or pulp. In fact, there are many dentists uh, and many dental students who don't want to place a pin for fear of having a perforation that's understandable. We'll give you some other techniques that you can use for auxiliary retention. So let's go through the whole technique. I'm going to create a small pilot, not a hole, but a dimple in the dentin with a quarter round burr. The pin must be surrounded by half a millimeter of dentin so that when we take a look at this line drawing, we can see the dentino enamel junction in the picture. Then imagine that we go about half a millimeter to the dimple. So we've got a, uh, the enamel, we've got half a millimeter, and we're into dentin. Here's an example of a pin, and it's too large a pin, placed at the DEJ enamel fracture at the interface. If you look very carefully, you can see an enamel fracture line radiating from that pin. This pin is way too large, and it's in the DEJ. Uh, that we want to place the pin with the right inclination. Here we're looking at a pin and on the facial you can see the pin was placed uh, towards the outside of the tooth. You can actually see the pin and a crack within the enamel on the facial surface. When this tooth is prepared for a crown that pin will actually disappear in the crown preparation. It won't be there to retain the amalgam at all. So we need to consider our alignment. We're going to use a twist drill to give us a 2 millimeter depth, so it's going to be a latch type right angle handpiece. We're setting the torque setting to about 75%. We're running the twist drill very slow, setting it on 1 so it's running at 5,000. And the self limiting twist drill 2 millimeters into the dentin like this. So we've done our pin channel, and the pin channel is smaller than the pin itself. Remember, the pin is like a giant screw, similar to the screw you'd use in wood. It'll self-thread itself into the dentin. The dentin will collapse because of the tubules. So here's our pin channel. 
in the dentin itself. We then go in and we place our pin drill. We have a mandrel, a plastic sleeve, holding the drill. The drill seats to two millimeters and then it self shears from the plastic sleeve and it separates, leaving the drill by the pin by itself. Two millimeters of the pin extend out of the dentin, two millimeters into the dentin. Sometimes the drill extends more than uh, two millimeters out. We don't want it more than two for amalgam. It can be more than two for composite. Whenever you have to cut the pin to length, you use a diamond to cut it. You don't use a uh, you don't use a a fluted burr. A burr will actually tease the drill out of the dentin. So use a diamond, running it on a high speed with lots of water spray. Hold the top of the drill pin. Uh, with a cotton pliers uh, so that it doesn't uh, hold the pin below it with the cotton pliers stabilizing and holding the pin in place. I misspoke a moment ago. Place the pin channel. Don't. Don't ever do this. Don't place the pin channel in the pulp. Don't place the pin channel in the PDL. Don't break the pin drill in the channel in and out with the pin drill, one penetration of the dentin with the drill, then remove. Don't go in and out more than once because it will enlarge the channel and the pin will not engage. Now what do you do if the pin drill breaks in the channel? If the pin drill breaks in the channel, leave it alone. Drill a new channel half to one millimeter away from the broken drill. So alternatives to pin retention include slots within the tooth, channels within the tooth, grooves, adhesives for non-vital teeth, posts, and placing the restorative material in the root canal. And everything that's true for amalgam is true for composite, although more likely we'll be using adhesives with composites and auxiliary retention uh, into the tooth. So let's look at channel slots and grooves. So our types of accessory retentions, slots, grooves, channels, peripheral steps. Our instrumentation will be a 35 inverted cone burr, a 330 burr, all done with a slow speed. And to the right, you can see a, a slot done in the preparation around by the line angle. Instead of using a pin, a composite or amalgam will be placed in that amount of the tooth structure. And here are some visuals of what slots and channels look like. When we make a channel in a tooth using a 330 or 245 burr, our depth must be a minimum of one millimeter, and that you notice that it's wider on the dentin side than it is within the deeper part of the dentin. The width in this countersink, this wider head of uh, restorative material, is so that the restorative material won't break at that interface. It helps stabilize it, it gives extra strength, better physical properties to the restorative material. So look in the right and you'll see it's a wider diameter than it is a channel. So here we're using a 330 burr with a high speed, placing a slot in the uh, dentin uh, of the tooth. Our restorative material will be placed in the slot that's on the right hand side. So now we're going to have to place a matrix. And I, I will tell you that a matrix placed for these large cusp replacement restorations where not much tooth structure is remaining can be very difficult. As you twist down and tighten a Toffelmeyer matrix, the band will want to collapse. We can use a Toffelmeyer matrix. We can use a copper tube as a matrix. And there's also a specialized matrix that has no retainer called called an auto matrix. In the clinic, have faculty help you and introduce you to the use of these. Now, if you're using a composite resin core, the bottom statement, that we can use a light cured composite or a dual cured composite without a matrix in some circumstances using our PFI instrument to shape the composite. The larger the overextended preparation, the more difficult matrix placement will be, the more difficult it will be to stabilize the matrix. If the matrix isn't stable, you can't place an amalgam, 
you need to place a composite. The matrix must be stabilized for placement of, a, of an amalgam restoration. When you have these large overextended preparations, uh, have a faculty member help you with matrix placement. Absolutely. Here we're looking at a tougher wire matrix. Notice that the matrix is placed and tightened so that the lingual surface will mimic the contour that I want. There'll be times that this matrix on the lingual, like on the left-hand side, will collapse and we'll have to uh, untighten the matrix band. Uh, in this case, you can see uh, that uh, there is a channel and a box preparation to help retain the restorative material. Once again, our placement of a matrix. And don't forget to stabilize the matrix with wedges. There are other types of devices. Here we're looking at an auto matrix, a circumferential 360 degree matrix that has no retainer, but has a retaining clip built in for placement. On the left hand side for the supreme mower, we'll be placing the restorative material into the pulp chamber itself for retention. Versus for these ivorine teeth, we can see two pins placed uh, on the distal of a uh, tooth number 18 and wedges in place to stabilize the matrix band. Sometimes the only choice for a matrix when walls are missing of the tooth is a copper band. We do have copper bands in the clinic. And copper bands is an art to learn how to place them. If a faculty member wants you to use a copper band, uh, have them show you how to cut it and how to fit it and how to stabilize it. Because of the thickness of a copper band, as you notice in the lower right hand image, uh, many times it's difficult to get uh, uh, proximal contact. You can use a copper band for amalgam placement if it's stable or for composite placement. Also assess the periodontal condition of the tooth. For this tooth, before even placing a matrix, I'm going to have to remove the excess gingival tissue in the mesial box, and I need to get at least a millimeter beyond the tooth on the facial. I'm going to have to lay a flap in order to place the matrix band. So for this tooth, I placed a flap. I actually used my gingival, uh, my retainer to move the gingiva out of the way and then placed a copper band holding it in place using wedges. Once again, I wouldn't expect even a senior dental student to be able to do this without help from a faculty member and instruction. For this case, we had pins placed and we placed an amalgam and you can see the sutures in place to bring the gingival tissue back. What about using a bonded amalgam, using an adhesive? Not all adhesives can be used with amalgam. In fact, you need to use a dual cure adhesive when placing amalgam. In our clinics, we have Scotch Bond Multipurpose, where we use it as a dual cure adhesive, where we're mixing a primer and an activator together placing it in the cavity preparation for 15 seconds. We dry it for the preparation for five, and then we mix one drop of adhesive and catalyst, and we apply the adhesive and catalyst into the preparation. We mix the amalgam, place amalgam right away. You'd need to read the instruction sheets when using this material. It isn't something I expect you to memorize. It's not something you'll do very often. In fact, Mostly in our clinics, we're using dual cure composite resin core materials. And that'll be presented in module B uh, of this operative lecture group. See, here we have an endodontically treated uh, premolar that will receive a porcelain fused to metal crown. The matrix is applied, and we rub the internal of the matrix with wax before application because in this case we're doing amalgam bonding. And so we're going to place some wax in this area on both mesial and distal so the adhesive doesn't allow the amalgam to adhere to the stainless steel matrix band. I etch the tooth for 15 seconds. I rinse and dry. 
and here it is rinsed and dried so I've etched the tooth I've etched within the root canal itself I've mixed my Scotch Bond multi-purpose together my activator and my primer painting it into the uh, pulp chamber, into the root canal, and into the tooth itself. I then air dry for five seconds. I then mix my amalgam. At the same time, I'm applying my adhesive. I don't allow the adhesive to cure. I'm placing them simultaneous. So with the adhesive still wet, I'm placing my amalgam into the preparation. And here my amalgam is placed. Now, do I need a bonding agent for this preparation? Well, for this one, probably not. There's additional tooth structure on the buckle, additional tooth structure on the lingual, as well as the fact we're within the root canal itself, so we don't need adhesive for this preparation. But I'm using it as a demonstration of the use of a bonding agent for placing amalgam. Here my amalgam is completed and carved, and you might say, do I need to do such a good anatomic carving? Remember, you're going to be taking a polyvinyl siloxane material, uh, whether it be a putty or whether it be a bite impression tray, and you'll be using this to make a template for your uh, provisional, so you can place your bisacral, your integrity material, to make your provisional restoration. So the goal is a functional an anatomically correct restoration so that we can go in and make our template for our crown. So that we make our provisional restoration, it's going to be accurate to the contours and it's going to take into account the preparation design we have, whether we do an all ceramic crown or whether we do a porcelain fused to metal. You've been watching Direct Cusp Replacement Restorationist Course Foundations for Crowns using dental silver amalgam, also going through the principles for uh, placement of cusp replacement restorations uh, for composite as well. OP10B will go through the techniques for composite placement and the choices we have with composite.